Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Boxer Report, episode 289. I am your host, 289, excuse me, I am your host, Michael, joining me this week. I'm Gail from Community Digital News, Daniel from The Inscriber. What's going on, lady and gent? Evening, everybody. We are here to rescue your Monday from the doldrums and boxing's back. Indeed, indeed. absolutely. Absolutely. Boxing, boxing is officially back. Uh, two cards that took place last week. Uh, for those who are new to Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report, live YouTube show, podcast, as well as blog, discussing all things boxing. The motto is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. The bottom line is if it concerns the sweet science, we will talk about it. Um, if you want to find out any and all information on the show, uh, the blog page is the best place to go to right now. My apologies for not really updating things, but um, if you want to find out where to find the show, on where to find Powerful Power Box Report all over social media, if you're watching live on YouTube, you can check the description box below. If not, uh, you can check the blog page to top right of the blog page where to find us on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, um, where to find us on all RSS feeds that carry that's carry podcast formats um, where you can donate, got a pack, cash me at PayPal donation link. And the last but certainly not least, uh, link to my online um, coaching page. I am an online coach with Beachbody.com. Uh, a lot of great deals on Beachbody right now, uh, given the fact that we are still dealing with this pandemic and a lot of folks are unfortunately still at home. Um, might as well get yourself a good workout in. Uh, get your fitness game going on. Let's get things started going to you, Gail. Um, boxing is back. Um, Bob Arum had two events this week uh, on the 9th and, no, uh, on the 9th and the 11th, yes. Uh, let's start with the card on the 9th. The headliner, of course, was um, Shakur Stevenson, WBO featherweight champion. He took part in a non-title bout um against a fighter by the name of uh Caraballo uh, Felix Car Caraballo and as anticipated uh, Stevenson dominated I, he put Caraballo down early um had his way throughout ended the bout in round six with a beautiful combination uh right hook to the body uh, he evaded a counter left hook from Caraballo countered with his own left uppercut to the pit of the stomach put Caraballo down in a heap uh, he didn't rise. I know that the opponent was inferior. However, did you ascertain anything from this bout? I would just say personally, I was looking at uh, Stevenson's physique. Uh, he came, the bout was at 130 pounds. Uh, he looked fuller to me, uh, surprisingly fuller to me. I watched this fight. And I'm like, okay, he did what he had to do. He's a talent for sure. But the biggest thing that I got from this Gale is that, yes, he may have a belt at featherweight, but this kid, he's only 22, he's going to be moving up very, very soon. Absolutely agree with everything you said. And Stevenson has really not made much of, of a secret of wanting to move up to 130. This was really a road test. You know, he was getting behind the wheel. At 1.30 for the first time, see how it goes. You know, he's not going to burn rubber. He's going to see, you know, does it work for him? Does it feel different? Does it slow him down? Which, you know, getting fuller and putting on a little more weight, you might gain some power, but you might lose some speed. Sometimes it's a trade-off you're not willing to make. <laughs> Seem to be fine. And he's made no secret that... Other than Josh Warrington, there's not a whole lot left for him at 126 that he's interested in. And it's getting hard for him to make weight. Yeah, that's what happens. And he really likes a lot of those names up at 140. And there are lots and lots of makeable fights. If he can stay at 130 a while, settle in, oh, he's got a ton of fights ahead of him. And it seems like the guy in his gun sights is one Mr. Gary Russell Jr. It's interesting. Of all the guys he's named, that's always the name that comes up first and always the name that seems to get him a little more animated. Uh, but as for this fight, yeah, Tara Bile, God bless him. You know, he took the fight. 
he was way outgunned, but he, he gave it his shot. He got in the ring. I will give anybody props for that. Uh, where a lot of other guys are not willing to get in the ring right now. And we'll talk about a few of them later in this uh, podcast. So good for them. Uh, and it was just good to have boxing back. Come on. It, it was also a shakedown cruise for top rank. How did this setup work? They're now calling this venue the bubble. In fact, if you look in box rec, uh, where it lists venues, it actually says now the bubble Las Vegas, which really cracks me up. But you know what? Everything seemed to work well. They learned from the Tuesday card, which we'll talk about. Um, you know, they tightened things up a little bit um, after they explored how the sanitation protocols all work. The testing protocols worked, although you talked to Michaela Mayer, maybe not as well as she thought they should work. So all in all, a good way to come back. And, you know, good for Shakur Stevenson for being willing to step out and be first. That is not easy. That is uncharted territory for everybody. And he did it. So Fol hat, hat tip to him. Follow up question before I go to Daniel. You mentioned Michaela Mayer, as we reported last week, uh, Michaela Mayer uh, uh, tested positive for COVID-19. Um, Stevenson's trainer, uh, one of Stevenson's trainers, uh, his name escapes me right now. K. Um, Karoma, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. He he was pulled out of the main event because he also worked with um, Mayer, and even though he tested negative for COVID-19, uh, because he had been working with Mayer, uh, they, this, uh, they erred on the side of caution and pulled him out of, of uh, uh, Stevenson's corner. Given that, uh, does that make you uh, concerned uh, moving forward? Uh, it doesn't. Uh, you mean as far as how the testing is working? Yeah, Don't well, how the testing is working yeah. and, and whether the fact that if we continue to have uh, uh, whether fighters or, or people closely associated with them, trainers and whatnot, um, possibly test positive or for COVID-19 or having to be removed as a result of someone they're working with testing you know, positive COVID-19. Oh, it's going to happen. It's absolutely going to happen. You know, 3% of everybody who's being tested average across the country tests positive. You're, you're, you're going to have a few more test positive who are probably going to be very surprised that they're asymptomatic feeling perfectly okay, uh, that was Mayer's situation. And then in her subsequent test, she tested negative. So she's questioning whether the first test was truly accurate, but now that she's got a clean bill of health, she can go back in the rotation. And I'm betting anything now, looking back at this, the reason another opponent wasn't found for her original opponent to keep the fight on the card is I'm sure you're just gonna pick it straight up keep those two ladies um, as opponents for each other because it was a pretty good matchup and move it to a subsequent card later in the month. She'll be, she'll be back, but we're going to see fighters test positive and you do want to see positive tests, meaning that the protocol is working before they are ill, before they circulate with a lot of other people and catch them, catch them early, get them well, get them through it, move them to the end of the rotation and, and come on back. It behooves everybody else who's in the bubble when they get there and while they're training and sparring to be cautious. But, hey, it's going to happen. Um, I'll go to you, Daniel, your impressions of, of uh, Stevenson. And I mentioned that um, I think he's moving up sooner rather than later. How long do you anticipate him staying at 126 pounds? You think he's just going to stay for um, um, a Warrington, try to get that fight at the end of the year, by the end of this year, early first quarter next year, and then just go up to 130 and probably, I think, 135. I think that's where he'll top out at. <clears throat> well, right. As far as him uh, looking, he looked really good at 130. 
I say, uh, he like he Gail mentioned, he looked fuller. He did look more like a, a weight for him down the line, and it actually would be the better move for him because mentioned Warrington is the only right now fight that makes sense for him to stay at featherweight, but. Right now, with everything that's happened, the only way you make that fight is if you go to the UK, if you go to Lee. Big crowd. Because even though the gov even though the go governor, Governor Murphy, did renounce his probably not going to want to pile up in the, in the big arena in New Jersey right now. But he looked good for this way. He, Miss Caballero, did like to sur survive longer than I thought he would. But Stevenson ended it with a good, they're doing a steady good amount of body work. And ultimately, it was a good show for 130. The question is now, though, make inroads in that weight class. Because a lot of the names that he mentioned, like you mentioned, Mr. Rosa Jr. It's happily sitting on the other side of the Um, I I'll go to you. Uh, I'll go back to you, Gail, and talk you about this. Uh, I'm there. I'm here. Um, I'm going back to you, Gail, talk about this next fight. Uh, these two main events, these two top ranked cards took place at the uh, 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 privatized Las Vegas, I think, a Las, a Las Vegas, a facility in Las Vegas designed specifically by a, a, a top rank. Um, the other card that took place on the 11th was headlined by Jesse Magdalena against a fighter by the name of Vicente. Okay, Magdaleno, he won by disqualification. Um, I can't remember the round. I want to say seventh round. But I'm looking at this. Yeah, he got, he scored a couple of knockdowns. But Magdalena, who's moving up to 126 pounds, he called out Gary Russell after the fight. And I'm like, even though he won here, can you see a scenario where he beats the champions at, a, at 126 pounds? Do you see a scenario where they pit him in against a Russell, pit him in, in against a Stevenson, pit him in against a... Um, Josh Warrington, who's IBF belt holder at featherweight, or uh, Kanzu, who's WB, uh, WBA. Um, do you see a scenario where he beats any of those guys? Personally, I don't. Well, I think we shouldn't read a tremendous amount into seeing these guys early on. You know, it's a, it was an odd situation. The venue they're in is a conference room, a very large ballroom, actually, in the MGM's MGM Grand Hotel's conference center. The conference center sits behind the hotel proper to the east, separate building, and it's where typical big, you know, commercial, you know, conferences take place, conventions, right? So this is a 60,000 square foot ballroom, and they have divided it off so that it got partitioned off individual dressing rooms. They've put the ring there. They've really dressed it up with a lot of lighting and signage. Um, it's it's exceptionally well done. Uh, credit to Top Rank and particularly the MGM and their convention folks. And I've got to say they must have had an assist from their Hawkinson nightclub group because it's it's flashy. It really fills up the space. It's hard to tell. There isn't a crowd there. And this venue has been used before. This is this is this fight tomorrow, adding up two fights last week. There have been three previous cards there, and I've been in that ballroom before. I actually saw a card uh, headed up by Ryan Garcia in, in 2017. So they're making good use of it. it. Seems to work, but it's a weird situation. You know, they're being tested. They can't leave the hotel. They're staying on the grounds. It's just very foreign. And 
Poxers are creatures of habit. You know, they like things a certain way. They get in a rhythm. They like things the way they're used to it. Nothing is normal right now. Absolutely nothing. A lot of these guys, yeah, maybe they've been in the gym and they've stayed on weight more or less, but they haven't really been training. They're not sparring, you know, unless, you know, they're doing it in secret. So maybe they got in a little bit of sparring. So I take all of it with a grain of salt. Having said that, the minute Yennefer Vicente, who's a Dominican-born fighter who fights out of Miami, um, the minute he started feeling the heat from Magdaleno, um, he decided to make it a dirty street fight. Now, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, a lot of guys do that, Orlando Salido, so, and we love him for it. But it's up to the referee to let the guys know, okay, you know, I get it. You know, you're going to slam someone with the front of your elbow. You're going to mess up, mess them around, clenching and this and that. But they need to draw the line in the sand. You can come up to here and no more. And if I catch you, you know, you're going to pay the price for it. And they cannot tolerate the low blows and the rabbit punches. And man, Vincente just you know, willfully ignored any protocol. And unfortunately, he also drew Robert Byrd. Robert Byrd has had a long, successful career as a referee, and perhaps the, that's the problem. He's had a long career as a referee. And I'm sorry, I don't care how good a shape you're in, how sharp or experienced you are, Age causes you to lose a step. We all know that. And he's a little slow to come in and break guys up. So that just made it even worse. I mean, at one point, he had he, he died. The first illegal punch um, midway through the fourth round, he docks Vicente two points. You know, and here's Magdaleno wiggling around on the ground. Um, he took another point in the round. I mean, in a 10 round fight, you know, it became pretty clear two knockdowns, three points taken away for low blows. I mean, Vicente's trainer could have just said, you know, you're getting paid, we're done. But, you know, they kept going and, you know, they forced Vicente to try and pursue the stoppage. And it just got messier and messier. And finally, Bird decided he'd had enough and called for the DQ. Now, here's the interesting thing. It was in the seventh round, right near the end of the seventh round. Here's the scores at the time of the stoppage. Two of the cards were 87-79. Okay, all right. Um, mine would have been maybe a little wider than that, but okay. And then Dave Moretti had the fight. Remember, there were two knockdowns and three, three points taken away. And he had the fight 85-81. Excuse me? <laughs> what were you watching that none of the rest of us saw? Damn. And in any event, um, Magdaleno later, he said, yeah, I would have liked to take him out. But, you know, he was just a dirty guy. And he he was, you know, he, he, didn't, he didn't know how to come in. He said he knew he was frustrated and he decided to fight dirty and go low and, you know. There you are. So, yeah, messy. It, funny enough, Magdaleno also wants Gary Russell Jr. <laughs> you know, he, he, want, he says now that he believes after that fight he'll be the top contender uh, in the WBC. Eh, we'll see about that. But um, I think he, he is certainly deserves a shot at any of the division champions, whether he – can take him. I think he'll make it competitive. Do I think he'll win? No. Do I think he can make it entertaining? Yeah. Yes, I do. And that's good enough for me. Um, I'll go to you, Daniel, uh, to her point, to Gail's point, excuse me. Uh, once uh, Vicente got, uh, uh, became frustrated, he basically channeled his uh, uh, inner Dr Draymond Green and, and, and got a little bit dirty in there. Am I being a little bit too critical, too harsh um, on him uh, in the aftermath of this fight? 
in terms of how, uh, in terms of comparing him. Uh, shout out, Emma. Shout out, Emma. What's going on? What's going on? Thanks for listening to us live. Uh, am I being a little bit too critical of Magdaleno after this fight and, and, and comparing him to the top, to the big dogs at 126 pounds? Are you there, Daniel? I don't think Daniel's there, so I'm going Daniel. back to you. Get okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Daniel. You had your mic muted. It's not that much to be disappointed. In. It's not. Yeah, it's not so much that you can say that it's disappointing, Magdaleno. You can understand the circumstances. Like you mentioned, there's not a lot of time to train, not a lot of time to look at, but. He really wasn't all there after that first. And excuse me for interrupting. Um, I, I, I excuse me for interrupting, like Daniel. I said tenth round. Afterwards. I said tenth round, Daniel. But it's it was actually round seven. Um, I wanted to make that correction. Yeah, the inverse. Yeah, going into yeah, which that's the second thing. First, at some point, I thought Robert Bird decided. To to join the WWE referees rather than that's what like three low blows in this fight. You could have stopped that immediately after the first one. Right? And quite frankly, disqualifying a guy when there was one minute left in the fight, there was no question of who was going to win. Magdalena was going to win. So there was no really going to be any real controversy there. But the controversy was great in the fact that, unfortunately, Robert Burr has let it. And we have to remember, he was criticized a lot in that Andre Ward fight. Because a lot of people were fighting with Koblev, where people said that Andre Ward was getting away with a lot of low blows. A bit of a track record people's gonna know how it's looking, but as far as Magdalena challenging Gary Russell Jr. First, I find this is with Stevenson and Magdaleno. I find it funny that the main person your target is somebody that you more than likely, unless he leaves, is his tent. And right now he has no financial. So it's kind of funny. I don't think he's going to become like the top contender does. And if he gets a mandatory Gary Russell Jr., I think Gary Russell Jr. will handle Magdaleno pretty easily. That's the last performance. How would you compare with the other fighters at 126 pounds? Personally, I think I think Stevenson will box his shoes off. Um, Warrington. I think he outworks him, and I think Kanzu outworks him as well. You got your mic muted, Daniel. Yeah, he, he he's not ready for the top guy. He's he's not not of that weight class. This is poor to me like, like another type of situation. In one mini, and we've seen that what had happened to Mattis. He he beat I, that he did beat going into it, but against a top guy, I just don't see it. Unfortunately, at this point. Uh, keep your mic open, Daniel. You can open your mic as, up as well, Gail. I'm going to give you time, give you two the opportunity to talk about uh, any other fights uh, within these two cards that uh, y'all you guys found noteworthy and want to discuss right now. Well, I will jump in and say that for me, the best fight of the week was the opener on Thursday, which was the co-feature um, under the Magdaleno fight. Uh, with Adam Lopez against Louis Coria. 
and it was a barn burner, total crowd pleaser. If there'd been a crowd at the bubble, they would have loved it. Lopez isn't a real well-known name, but his, his great claim to fame at this point for most fans, if they knew anything about him, is that he was a last minute replacement. And I mean like a last minute, two or three day replacement to fight Oscar Valdez, knock Valdez down on way on the way to losing. And it, it was, it was a TKO loss, but it was a very quick stoppage. He was on his feet. He was not in distress. Um, so he lives to fight another day. He wanted to put on a show. He had an opponent who was ready to engage in Louis Coria. Good for him. He came right at him from the opening bell. And uh, Coria got the better of Lopez the first two rounds. And Lopez admitted he just didn't get off to a real quick start. But when Lopez settled down, he relied more on his footwork, um, worked behind his jab. And he has been taught to use a very educated jab by his trainer, Buddy McGirt. Buddy has really worked on that, and it looks good. Think about what a good job McGirt did resurrecting Sergey Kovalev's jab before Canelo got to him. Uh, he's done the same exact thing with Lopez, um, except that he's got more tools and a, and a youngster uh, to grow and work with. So when he could work that way and and pivot and get out of Coria's way, he did a lot better. But Coria, you would thought at the pace they were fighting, and especially considering what had to be a lack of normal conditioning, that they'd slow down. Coria never slowed down. And Lopez said he hit him several times with body shots, and he literally heard the wind go out of him. And Coria just stayed himself on his feet and kept on coming. He said that he just could not tire him out, could not slow him down. Um, and Correa kept accumulating damage. You know, if you just looked at these two guys after the fight, you would have thought, oh, Lopez must have lost because he had some pretty swollen eyes. But um, Lopez did what he needed to do, um, winning the middle rounds, and he, and he definitely won the last round. Um, he said he had hurt his hand uh, landing that that hard jab. Um, so maybe that was a little of it and couldn't stop him, but, um, it's a good outing. They're young guys. They're damned entertaining. They threw 1400 punches in those 10 rounds. Um, Lopez has a secondary Lopez's main nickname is blue nose, but his secondary nickname is the Glendale Gotti. And you, you can see why they, they call him that. Um, Coria is a young guy out of, uh, the Inland Empire area here in California where Garcia's gym is located, Robert Garcia's gym is located. And, uh, Coria, uh, will definitely get some more fights. He showed himself well. Um, and it was fun to listen also without the crowd present to the nonstop dialogue that is Robert Garcia when one of his guys is in the ring. And that's exactly how he is. Every fight, he never slows down. You hear him, you know, switching from English to Spanish. I don't think he even recognizes. He just picks the best words. Spanglish. Spanglish. Yeah, you just pick the best word for both languages. It totally works. It's it's all it's all Robert. Yeah, it it's something that we get to hear um, on early undercards, and I'm I'm glad the fans got to hear it and. And then when Buddy McGirt decided to start uh, yelling instructions to Lopez, then you had both of them going. <laughs> that was part part of the fun of seeing the fight. It certainly, for me, um, in a lot of ways, made up for the fact that the fans weren't there. And, and truthfully, for me, I didn't really notice that the fans weren't there, especially for these cards, because, you know, truth be told, other than a couple of named name rising fighters in the main events being Shakur Stevenson on Tuesday and Jesse Magdaleno on Thursday. These are club fights, guys. These are showbox style cards. Tomorrow's car or tomorrow night's card is very much a showbox type card. So doesn't mean we aren't going to be entertained, but 
you do need to understand exactly what it is you're seeing. And that's what we're seeing. I might go to you, Daniel, any other fights you wanted to talk about or, or highlight um, that was uh, within these two cards? Unfortunately, due to work, I did miss a lot of it. I actually tried to home in time to watch the main events. So, and I haven't, unfortunately, had time to DVR most of it. So I will admit my ignorance on the on the inner cards for the most part. But okay, it is to watch it tonight. Well, okay. Uh, point go ahead. point to both you gentlemen who are on the East Coast. Would you like to see these start a little later in the evening? Because I'll tell you, I, I got to think even with a lot of people working from home, cards that are starting. At four, four, you know, four p.m. on the West Coast for the Tuesday card. Thankfully, what they did learn is they didn't need four hours, and they tightened things up. Um, it started at five p.m. on the West Coast, eight p.m. Eastern time. Did it feel a little early to you? Uh because of my work schedule, it really wouldn't matter because I get home late anyway. So I'll defer to Daniel in terms of that question. Yeah. I mean, do you think maybe another hour backing it up another hour, making it 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Uh, would do the job? Uh, I'll let you handle that question, Daniel. That might work. That might actually work. Because yeah. I'll tell you that the ratings, unfortunately. It might work a little bit better. Because yeah. in all honesty, yeah. Yeah. The but ratings have been a little disappointing. The main thing you want to do with yeah. scheduling is sure that you're not colliding with any other. Yeah. 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 But um, this is the main thing. They're competing a lot right now in the schedule. Let's see. Yeah. So baseball. As far as I'm concerned, baseball's dead this year. The NBA is likely headed in that direction this year, too, with the way things are looking. So, so yeah. the only competition right now, live comp if you think about sports right now, would probably be NASCAR. And if you're gonna and I'm sorry, if you're gonna give if you're gonna give me a choice between Boston and NASCAR. So yeah, it, it would benefit them more probably to start a little bit later. And especially to try to get more normal routine. Because most of the cards, even when they're club fights, the show box cards, those at like around 9 or 10 p.m. in that area. Yeah, absolutely. So show it's good to stay, like I said, in that routine. Yeah, show box is usually at 10 p.m. Eastern start. For, for the televised portion. Now, we do have to allow for the fact we're getting to see literally the entire card. There's, you know, between four and six fights, depending on, you know, who tests positive and tests out and who makes weight. But, you know, for tomorrow night, for example, you know, you've got a five fight card. Sorry, I was on mute there. Let's move on to some news here. Uh, yeah, yeah, Emma, shout out to uh, uh, Bubba Wallace and, and what he's done um, in NASCAR and his role and having the Confederate flag basically you removed from that sport. Let's move on to some news here. I'm going to you on this one, Daniel. Uh, this news broke, big news broke actually a day after, in the hours after uh, the end of our last episode. And that is uh, Anthony Joshua, who holds three of the belts at heavyweight, WBA, IPF, WBO. Um, he and Tyson Fury, who's WBC, uh, heavyweight title holder, uh, have agreed in principle, have agreed on a financial basis uh, to fight each other twice in 21, 2021. Now, a lot, this is contingent on uh, both getting rid of the, the, winning their mandatories. Fury has a mandatory coming up against Deontay Wilder. Their third fight that's going to happen this fall, um, while Joshua, he's supposed to fight uh, Kubrat Pulev, who I believe is the number one contender in terms of the IBF. I could be wrong on that, but I believe it's the IBF. That fight is going to happen, I believe, in November. Assuming both men win, um, your thoughts on this announcement that is, hap that is being announced now? And 
does the cynic in you say, yeah, they're talking about this fight happening in 2021 or two fight deal, but does the cynic in you say that they talk about it now, but something will come along and the and, and, and the fights will not happen? Yeah, I'm the cynic here. There are no contracts signed. There's too many stuff that's going to go into it. And Tyson Fury can do Tyson Fury things. This means absolute. As far as getting hyped for a fight, these two have been talking about fighting for how many years now? It's nourishing. I don't see it happening. At least not until I see paper signed. We, have to, we also have to look into what Tyson was expecting. He was probably expecting right now this time to fight Wilder, and then he probably expected another like, little big money deal with WWE to show up in Saudi Arabia and do something crazy again. Right now, the Wilder fight is being pushed to the fall, and more than likely, they're not gonna be, there's not going to be a Saudi show with WWE this year. So he needs something to keep himself entertained. So this could be it, and staring... I said stirring the pot once again. But knowing full well that this could fall apart at any moment. He could get back into it, which opens up the door for Deontay Wilder to knock him out. Joshua might get sloppy again. And then you say, who left win? Talking about this now without any paper sign just happened up now. Let's be blunt. This means absolutely fucking nothing. Tell us how you really feel. Do you echo? <laughs> do you echo? Do you echo Daniel sentiments? You, t you, I, you said those words as they flowed through my brain. Tell us how you really feel. Um, yeah, you're right. Yeah, everybody getting very excited about anything sports right now. Any little bubbles on the bottom of the pan because we got nothing else, right? So this discussion, this agreement. Um, it, it's, it's a party trick at this point. It gave ESPN and top rank a dandy live interview with Tyson Fury. And did we all watch it? Oh yeah. Did the rest of the world, you know, tune in, get curious, start discussing it on social media. Oh yeah. Are we talking about it right now on the pound for pound boxing report? Oh yeah. Job done. Mission accomplished. We're all talking about them. We're all keeping them relevant. You know, we get to get our little dose of Tyson Fury. Um, we have no idea what's going to happen that far out. We can't plan a week, two weeks, three weeks ahead. The incubation period of the coronavirus is at its lengthiest average, 14 days. That's about as far ahead as anybody should be thinking right now about just about everything. So, you know, venue unknown, money unknown, you know, until there's a time and a place and we know what they're getting paid, it's all just talk. You know, until there's a ring on the finger and a date, don't count on anything. Um, and speaking of not counting on anything, I mentioned how I mentioned that this fight is contingent on both men uh, uh, winning their mandatory as well. Uh, when it comes to Tyson Fury and his mandatory uh, one, Dillian White, um, Dillian White is determined, I say, he's determined, damn it, to uh, uh, get his shot at the WBC title. For those who do not know the backstory, White um, has been number one contender at heavyweight, uh, according to the WBC, since 2017. Uh, been mandatory since 2018. That mandatory status was uh, temporarily suspended um, in 2019 due to uh, suspicious uh, of a drug test, a positive drug test. It was cleared. Uh, White was cleared of any wrongdoing, but during that interim time, the WBC granted that mandatory status to one Fury who took advantage, uh, uh, fought the rematch against Wilder, uh, defeated Wilder for the belt, and in the aftermath, both Wilder and uh, Bob Arum, who promotes uh, 
both Fury, excuse me, both Fury and Bob Arum, who promotes Tyson, um, have been very dismissive of one deal in white. Uh, Bob Arum has talked about that White's value carries no more than um, Tom Schwartz, who uh, Fury fought uh, last year. Um, Fury has said that White is just doing uh, raising hell about getting a fight with Fury. He's just doing it for the money, um, saying that uh, he's not really a cash cow. He's not marketable. Um, Eddie Hearn, who promotes Dillian White, has uh, been um, vouching for one Dillian White. Talk some trash to uh, Bob Harum. Um, I wrote about it for Three Kings Boxing. Just go to Three Kings Boxing and find the article about that. He's been defending White as he should. Uh, today, as a matter of fact, Dillian White filed a lawsuit against the WBC. Uh, I'll go to you, Gail, and you can follow up, Daniel. What, what do you make of the saga, the drama between White, uh, between White and Eddie Hearn on the one hand, Tyson Fury and Bob Arum on the other hand, vis-a-vis -vis the WBC title. And this is all up against the backdrop that, according to the WBC, Dillian White is supposed to get a crack at the title by February 2022. But again, Arum looks like he's trying to finagle his way to petition the WBC to push that mandatory fight back at least a year in order to make this fight, these two fights with Joshua. Your thoughts on all of this? Uh, what a mess. You know, I don't know what Dillian White did to piss off Mauricio Suleiman so much. I, you know, did he, did he kill his dog? Did he let the air out of the tires of his car? Did he insult his wife? I have no idea. I think he's been the mandatory, you saying 2017, but He's been, yeah. he's been number one contender since been, 2017. Yeah, that seems like dog years. Hasn't it really been since about 2004? I mean, <laughs> it's been a hell of a long time. Now, Eddie Hearn did what he needs to do. He's the man's promoter. He shouldn't have White on the roster if he's not going to defend him. And he did. However, Eddie Hearn is can be a very practical guy. And you know what? Backing up a little bit, there's absolutely nothing wrong to wanting to fight for money. It's your job. We all want to get paid the most we can possibly get that we think we're, we deserve for what we do for a living. These guys have a very short shelf life. It is about what they can earn. And he's in a position as a number one contender to ask for a decent paycheck. However, Let's refer to the discussion we, we just had. You cannot plan anything. You cannot count on anything. We have no idea where anybody's money's coming from in the near term. And I say near term is next few months, the next year. We really do not know. We're in completely uncharted territory. So everybody's got to understand, you know, what the exterior circumstances are that a pot of money without fans, especially, might not be available. Or you may have to go to a venue in the Middle East where you know, you're really not counting on a gate, you're counting on a site fee. That makes a big difference. Um, you know, I think White is doing the right thing, pushing the issue. You know, is he gonna make his money with a step aside? Uh, I don't know. Are they just trying to maneuver him for negotiation purposes? Eh, maybe. But let's remember the discussion about uh, Joshua and Fury is not till next year. So, you know, do you negotiate to have Joshua fight Pulev and Fury fight White? You know, at this point, maybe. Then you have the issue of what do you do with Wilder, who's sitting on the sidelines. He wants his fight. It's a big fat mess, you know, but it, it makes for some interesting possibilities. I'll tell you what, I am very interested in seeing Joshua and Pulev, especially if they can stage it in one of the rumored venues, which is in Croatia, where Pulev would draw a pretty good crowd. And it's in an old uh, ruins of a Roman Colosseum, which apparently is um, 
still intact enough and stable enough to stage an event. Now well, that it's would not be gonna a happen. crazy it's event. Not gonna happen. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. Um, they ain't got enough money, and Eddie Hearn's not, not going to let that happen. Joshua well, wants to play at home. Yeah. He, that's why it's going to happen at home. But, but you know what? The virus gets to say. That's the problem. Can it happen? Can it? Let's see what will happen over the next few weeks as Premier League soccer returns to Great Britain. I think the first game is in a couple of days. They'll have a couple of weeks here to watch and wait and see how things transpire without crowds, or maybe they start adding back limited crowds. Who knows? That that will tell you what the market will bear, how things are going on in Great Britain. Yes, in a perfect universe, you should put all these British fighters together on British soil. You know, you're going to put... 50, 60, 80, 90,000 butts in the seats. They deserve it. Biggest fights in British boxing history uh, deserve to be in the UK. They do. But the virus gets a say. So we're going to have to wait, see what happens, see what's safe, see what's feasible, see what money is available. And, you know, crazy stuff can happen. You get, you know, get involved in. Uh, an accident in the gym, something happens outside the gym, you know, every day that goes by, some other crazy thing can insert itself. So, you know, folks, don't mark your calendar and ink pen just yet. Uh, I'll go to you, Daniel. Uh, uh, what do you make of um, what Gail described as this quote unquote mess? Not in a lot more formal terms than I than I would put it in. It's a goddamn mess. <laughs> it's because the whole the Billy and White situation is one where yeah, your promoter promoter is supposed to defend you, your promoter is supposed to gain into it. But WBC tied with your gateway to get into your cash cow. A cash cow who has now been proven to be vulnerable on multiple occasions on the biggest stage. Lost some of the luster by being beaten. By being not by being TK killed. Let's face it. And after but going and when it comes to the WBC, that's yeah, that's a diff, that's just a different monster. Or I don't know. I, I it has to be something. I don't. I don't know if it's the dog or maybe Dillian White said no to things like female relatives or something like that. I don't know. Something had had to happen there where it's been like three years. Unless it's just basically Suleiman wanted to get some of the Joshua money. But we go into that. that Dynamics when it comes into that whole fight nation. Who left could the main allure of this fight between Joshua and Fury is the fact that you can have an undisputed heavyweight champion. The IBF has proven a long time ago that it does not care. They they're the only sanctioning body to enforce the rules. And if Joshua told this, there's there is nothing that could that really would tell me the I've been your strip, who left you're the champion. And then you have to go through another bit because you know Bob Aaron is only gonna protect Pula any way he can. That's one and that's another thing. This is just a whole whole sort of mess. We're all talking about make a big money fight in an environment where it's not gonna be so the only place Right now, visibly, right now, have a chance. It's New Zealand. Because this pandemic, well, they have had, I think, almost three to four weeks where no, no new reported cases. And they just now started welcoming sports back with fans. Now, we don't know. 
if that's start, start going to happen, if that changes, we have to remember South Korea, they, they closed, Seoul closed their nightlife for, for another month because of guy. So we don't know what is going to happen here. I would not, I would, I know we need something to talk to. I know we want to talk about big money fine now. It is unethical to talk about it in a way. Because you're hyping up, up an event that logistically super conscious might not be able feasible to be made this year. Uh, excuse and we let just me have to focus um, on and when it uh, comes to big money fights, we have to get it to the mind twenty twenty one. Um follow up question, Daniel. Uh We've seen with both Canelo Alvarez and and Vasil Lomachenko, uh, the WBC create this franchise belt. And for those who are new to the show or don't follow this, this don't follow the sport with that with that intently, the franchise title is a a kind of made up title that the WBC made that created last year in which they give a certain fighter who's accomplished a certain amount of things or defended the, the WBC belt a certain amount of times, this distinction of being a franchise champion. And what happens with that is if you are a franchise champion, you are not obligated to make a mandatory title defense or make a, def a defense against the mandatory challenger within the WBC. I put that on the table, Daniel, because let's just say Fury defeats Wilder, or even Wilder defeats Fury, and there and Hearn uh, continues to demand that White demand that the WBC lives up to what they put on the pay, put on paper in terms of White getting a title shot by February 2021, which would mean the winner of Wilder, a Fury Wilder, would have to fight Dillian White next, early 2021, right? If that's Wild, if that's Fury, do you ever see him fighting a Dillian White? If he doesn't, would you consider that a duck, A, and B, would the WBC step in, grant Fury, the distinction of being a franchise champion, even though he's really done nothing to earn it, let's be honest. Do you think they would grant him the distinction of a franchise champion, let Dillian White fight for the WBC title, all that in pursuit of having this fight with Joshua and the money that comes along with it? Okay, uh, let's let's talk about the situation right now as it stands when it comes to these two scenarios they throw in there. Canelo, it was the middleweight title. Do more. I can answer this question with another. Would do you consider Jamal the real WBC middleweight champion? Technically, he is, but to people who really follow the sport, probably not. Probably no. They would still consider uh, uh, Canelo the, the real exactly. WBC champion. That's the issue here. When it... Exactly. That's the main factor. That's the main flaw in this franchise thing. Yes, the, the newer contender or the challenge for the title ain't going into it. But as long as you have this little hover around, if it's not an injury, it's not like a champion Emeretta situation, which, like, then, yeah, you understand it. Then you make it an interim championship. You just have a guy who claims he's a champion, but people will throw it as well. You just happen to be it because WBC likes this guy more and they want to keep making money with him. Gary has not earned that yet with the WBC. That's one. And two, when it comes into him not fighting white, I wouldn't consider it a duck. I would consider it the collapse of Britain's Cold War between Frank Warren and Eddie Hart. And the only 
way that would change is if Dillian White moves to the side of Frank Warren. Which wouldn't be that much of an issue for him. We have, Danny White has flown to the U.S. a couple of times to get some rounds in on some top brain cards. It's not out of the question, but it's the only way you can resolve it. it I really wouldn't consider it a duck at this point. But if he, if a situation would happen where they grant fear of franchise status, you you would have the same taste. In it your mouth with Dillian White that you have with Jamal Charm. Technically have the belt, but you're not really the champion. And that does leave a bitter taste in it. It's like putting an asterisk in your where it's like you're only the champion because of money, because of political reasons. You're not the champion because you've earned it. I probably would say Dillian White probably would go against that. He's, he seems like a guy that does seem hell bent on his title. So I would probably say, I would probably say that. Like it wouldn't be a duck, but at the same time, like if Dillian White got the belt through that manner, he wouldn't feel like a champion. I, I posed the same question to you, Gil, and I will add on. Daniel mentioned that, that, uh, even to put that scenario all together and the WBC will give him, will give Fury franchise status and, and White would fight and win the WBC title against whoever. Most people would consider Fury as the WBC heavyweight champion. Uh, I know we, uh, we're we reaching here because we don't know what will happen next, uh, but this is a scenario and this is a, a, a hypothetical here I know, but would that matter if, in the end, people want to see Fury Joshua and the WBC just cares about the money and the status that comes with that? Well, once again, you know, fighters deserve to get paid. They fight for money. And make no mistake, the commissions want to earn some dough to keep themselves solvent and moving along. And let's face it, you know, how much have the commissions in boxing made from sanctioning fees the last few months? Um, nothing, zero. They're in the same position as a lot of businesses have been. They haven't made a dime. So yeah, there's precedent for this. We've seen it with the WBC. Gives them a sanctioning fee at the highest level. It is not implausible at all to see this happen. Does it really change the matchups and how they get negotiated and all the external forces that we're talking about that are completely out of everybody's control? No, it doesn't change them at all. It's just one more wrinkle in the whole thing. One more thing for us all to get to talk about. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, what do you see uh, happening in terms of all of this? And the mandatories and Dillian White into the equation, um, let's just say six months from now. I'll start with you, Gail, and then I'll go to you, Daniel. So let's all acknowledge, first of all, that these predictions are absolutely useless, <laughs> completely, utterly useless. And every sentence has to have a lot of ifs in it. Well, if this happens and if that happens, but for the sake of discussion and uh, peace on the podcast. If you know, the health situation is under control and uh, it's feasible to have these big level fights at, at some level uh, that makes money for everybody, that makes sense is, you know, they're, the economy part of it plays out. And, um, you know, I think the most feasible is we see a fight in the Middle East and we do see it as Joshua and Fury because if they're really going to try to pull out the stops, given the constraints, I, I think you go for the bang for the buck and that's going to be it. That's going to be it. It's a shame. I, I, I'm very sorry 
for all of those UK fans who would love to see this fight at Wembley. What a spectacle. They do deserve it. I think that's a really tough call. And you have to remember that people are budgeting still. They still are hurting. We don't know what the pandemic economy is going to look like post pandemic economy. Um, you know, nosebleed seats in Wembley, if this wasn't in play, you know, that's such a big fight. Hell, those could be thousand dollar seats with 90,000 people at that place. I mean, it's, it's just a shame that the, the timing is such. Given the constraints, I think we're going to see Joshua and Fury in the Middle East very early next year. That's also the best weather, gives them a chance for the outdoor venue. Um, I think certainly the interest in the money is there. I want to uh, go to uh, before I go to you, Daniel. I want to give a shout out to once again Emma who joining us who listening live in the live YouTube chat. Uh, Saint Brit, uh, B Spaces, uh, listening as well. If you have any questions, um, please ask and um, appreciate your your commentary. Um, I go to you, Daniel. Again, I know this is an if scenario, and we just don't know for sure. But what do you see happening eventually? How do you see things falling? The way I see things falling, because I don't hands at the devil's playground when it comes to one Tyson Fury and the dude thinks of this pandemic. Like I said, this is just wild speculation on my end. Like we, like Gail said, we're all just be, uh, boardwalk fortune tellers right now, but I could see a scenario where it just doesn't take this seriously, gets knocked out by Wilder. And Pulev pulling out the miracle. Well, I want to, uh, let's just call it a miracle. Well, not anymore. Let's just say he uses a little bit of the Andy Ruiz first fight template and a little bit of the Klitschko template. I don't think he can, but I could see a scenario where instead of we'd seen Joshua Fury, we could see either Wilder Fury or Wilder Pulev right now because of the way this year has turned out. Like all the best day plans are laid to ruin. So I could definitely see that scenario where both Tyson Fury and then I think Joshua not sitting at the top of the mountain uh, by the end. Wow, wow, wow. Um, I think I think both will win. Um, I, th I think both will win. And I'm more inclined to believe to go with Gail's scenario. I think both will win. I think Fury and Joshua will happen. It will not happen in the UK, but it will happen um, in the Middle East because um, if they can lure Joshua and Joshua and Ruiz, the rematch over there, they can certainly put up the money to put uh, Joshua and, and, and Fury together. It'll be, it'll, it would suck for the UK, uh, for England specifically in the UK, but this is boxing, this is prize fighting and money talks. And, and speaking of prize fighting, um, Ryan Garcia has been talking a lot um, during this downtime, Gail, uh, whether it's trolling the likes of and trash talking the likes of uh, Geronta Davis and Devin Haney, or now um, uh, speaking out against uh, one design. Uh, Garcia was set to fight on July 4th, I believe was the date. Um, the fight fell through. Garcia went to Sports Illustrated after going on Twitter and, and basically hinting that he's going to uh, uh, bring big news to the table. But he went to Sports Illustrated to do an exclusive interview. I also wrote about this for Three Kings. And according to him, he was upset at the, the money that the zone was offering him for the fight. Uh, he found the $200,000 $200, offer um, insulting, saying that he deserves more, that 
uh, 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 based on the quote unquote numbers and social media following and all of this and that and its potential and whatnot. And I'm my response is um, um, one: uh, when you look at the zone, they don't deal with they don't deal with fighters directly. And one of the Garcia's complaints is that he doesn't want to go th- though he has no issue with Golden Boy. He doesn't want to go through Golden Boy. He wants to deal with the zone directly. Um, no, that's not how the zone works. It does it, uh, young man. And two, and more importantly, Gail, who is Ryan Garcia to make these kinds of demands? I know he's highly popular. I know he has potential, but you haven't even won a world title. Who have you really defeated yet? $200,000, something to sneeze at, sir? Brian, Ryan, Ryan, you know what, Ryan, if I was your mother, I would be smacking you upside the head. But, you know, sometimes these bratty kids, you know, are the product of the upbringing. You know, we we train them how to act. And and Ryan knows Ryan first of all Ryan is a very emotional person he just is and that is not a bad thing for a fighter when they can marshal that emotion to work for them and get heated up in the ring and make it work any guy with a mean streak that comes out in the ring they're emotional too they they take it in that direction you know Terrence Crawford comes to mind bud can get damned me so it, it's not a bad thing necessarily, but Ryan gets his feelings very easily hurt. And part of what he feels his leverage is, and he's not wrong about this, it's not his record. It's his economic worth to Golden Boy. Right now, Golden Boy's entire business plan is one Canelo Alvarez. Canelo Alvarez is completely carrying Golden Boy promotions. They're trying to buy some time until they develop a few more stars to start carrying the freight a little more. And Ryan's one of them. They know, Ryan darn well knows he is the heir apparent as far as being the cash cow there, unless he's eclipsed by one Virgil Ortiz Jr. Virgil's a much more serious guy. Virgil, you know, doesn't create quite the buzz among the general fans. You know, Ryan Garcia is very much in the Oscar De La Hoya mode in that he he goes beyond boxing's normal fan boundary. And that's enormously valuable because of the money it brings in, the potential it brings in. That's what Ryan's real worth is to Golden Boy. It's not his record, although he's done just fine. I mean, he has done, especially in the last year or two, everything Golden Boy has asked of him in the ring. He's delivered some exciting fights, some spectacular knockouts. Let's let's not forget that. Has he been tested? No. But I'm sure he looks at $200,000 and he thinks, wait a minute. Shakur Stevenson got 400000 to fight on ESPN. Well, he can argue that he's worth more money. He's picked the wrong venue. I don't, I don't begrudge him having that discussion. Well, first of all, his manager needs to get him under control and say, listen, take your business behind the scenes. You want to talk about it? You know, let's have a man-to-man conversation. Let's talk business. That's perfectly okay but he's young, he's hot-headed, he, he's emotional, he gets insulted, and then somebody needs to take the damn phone out of his hands when he's acting like that because I can't help but think deep down he regrets some of this stuff. The minute, you know, the minute it comes out of his fingers and goes out to the universe, you know, he, he tried to put some boundaries around it this time, saying that he was going after DAZN and not Golden Boy. But, you know, Ryan, for Pete's sake, man, it's just a, it's a weird time. Maybe he's just feeling, you know, completely stir crazy training at home and he's staying at his parents' house in La Jolla. I mean, that would get to the best of anybody. <laughs> so I, I get that. Unfortunately, Golden Boy and DAZN have called his bluff and said, well, you know, 
this is the situation. Here's where we're at. Their version of the bubble looks like it's going to be the Fantasy Springs casino venue out in India, which, which is ideal for them. It's a good draw um, when they can take fans. It's small enough and, and a, an interesting enough venue, easy to, for everybody out of LA to get to, much easier than, for them than going to Vegas. Um, although I understand the MGM is very interested in having them, but I think kind of owning their own version of the bubble out in the desert would be smart. But, you know, Virgil uh, is ready to play. So that's the problem. Virgil says, I just want to get in there. You know, he has a very different, very serious athlete's mentality. A lot of the extraneous stuff, he doesn't give a shit. He really doesn't. He just wants to fight. Um, you know, if you could cross the two together, <laughs> they both improve each other in, in some ways. Um, Virgil's getting better at the promotional aspect of things and the personality aspect of things, but he's just a lower key personality, you know, and Ryan is, you know, the pretty kid uh, with the skills. It looks like who may be able to back it up, you know, but golden, if, if he was not golden boys, future golden ticket, they wouldn't have put up with half the crap they have with him. I don't know how much longer they're going to be able to tolerate it before they kick him to the curb. I really don't. They just know they're slitting their financial throat if they do. And, at, you know, if we thought the WBC heavyweight situation was a mess, you know, this is a lightweight mess. Well, Daniel, one, um, he also threw fighters like – Davis and Haney into the equation. And my response to um, the young man is, well, Haney, he does kind of have his own company. So if he does work directly with the zone, it's because he has his own entity that's giving him the right to do so while you still tied to a promoter. One, two, again, who have you defeated? Who have you fought? What real contender have you been in the ring with? I know that this is 2020 and we're in a different dynamic in terms of earning power and earning potential and all of that because of, of the advent of social media and, and whatnot. Uh, but at the same time, is this a case of just a young man uh, who's getting caught up and getting too big for his britches? Well, yeah, it's we had to we had to take a lot of the generation that he's in the like Zoomer generation. They see Cloud as followers as social media. He does have a lot. The problem when it comes into it when to him and it comes to Tank is Tank has at least won a belt and won one convincingly against Pedraza. Now, as including his recent fuckery, that hurts him into it. And Devin Haney has been one of the few people that are enough to build it on his own and have smart people around him that are taking his career seriously into account. Ryan, like I said, right now, now you you signed the extension with Golden Boy. Granted, we all know that the only reason they were signed into it was to play Kate Canelo because you're now part of. But you're signed to a promoter. You made that decision. You have, have to let them do things for you when it comes. Oh, and you have to take into the account that because of the pandemic. Because of the economics, not a lot of people probably renewed their DAZN description, subscriptions lately. We all know, like Jacob, he had to 
cancel it because it was an expense he could no longer afford given the circumstances. A lot of people are going through that. A lot of things that the zone could sell outside of boxing in the U.S. were also hurt by the pandemic, so it doesn't really add value to it. So I get the battle, I get the money, but at the same time, though, you have to realize seeing this type of negotiation in all matter of sports when it comes into it, like, I mentioned it before, I mentioned it earlier today. Baseball, for all intents and purposes, should be considered dead this year as a point because people are not going to get out of their stances, and it's and pretty much is going to cost them the season. The NBA, despite what Adam said, it could easily head into that same route because there's too many variables. You're heading to a situation where the negotiation Negotiations between networks, broadcasters, promoters are in a completely, completely skewed playing field. We have not seen a situation like this before in this media age. So I would I would cool it if I was if I was Ryan Garcia. Because I showed you today, they will move beyond you. And quite frankly. Virgil right now is the better prospect and a lucrative weight division than you are, young man. So, chill out. Focus on fighting and build up to a title fight because, yeah, you're in the right division to really make some noise. Then just get down there and make some noise. Don't battle that good. The money's going to come, man. Uh, do you follow up? Do you think that 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 you could you see a scenario where Garcia could be just too much of a headache for for Golden Boy, and they either dump him, a or b, just rush him into the ring against uh, a champion, knowing he's gonna get his not his his block knocked off. Yeah, there's gonna come a point where he becomes more of a liability than an asset. But that's still some way away. That's still some distance away because of the economics. You know, I just cannot emphasize how much Golden Boy is leaning on Garcia to keep their business afloat until and unless Virgil Ortiz takes off. Let's say that in the next year, Garcia doesn't play ball and Ortiz does, and Ortiz has some kind of absolute star making performance out of who knows where that really sets the boxing world on fire then you're going to see garcia suddenly being told to sit in the back seat he won't take kindly to that and he'll be down the road same question to you daniel The only way it happens right now is if Canelo, as long as he's tethered to that team, to me, they will not try to burn that bridge. Now, can it become a big headache where Canelo's team will dump him up? Yes, he can. Because that team right now is getting pretty loaded. It's not like, it's not the Angel Garcia situation where we one person and that one person is his son. So it doesn't really count in some ways, but the Reynoso camp has built up. So a decent stable, not just for Garcia, but with Valdez. And if I forget, I think Andy Ruiz jumped into that camp. Yeah. Yes. So, and, and, uh, Cuban heavyweight prospect That's Steve. Sanchez is down there too now. So, yeah. Exactly. Like they have stable now. They have a steady group where they can. They, nobody can say to them now, like, "Oh, you're only half Canelo." 
Now, they have a pretty decent stable. They have improvements with the fight. Ryan Garcia among them. He's done pretty decent improvement under the Reynoso camp. But, like yeah. I said, but that is his main buoy right now. As long as he has the full backing of Canelo and the full backing of the Reynosos, Golden Boy's going to tolerate him. Yeah, right. I, I, I actually question Unless that, that group, there. unless Canelo and the Reynosos turn their backs on him, Golden Boy's off. Yeah, I asked that question out there, kind of knowing the answer anyway. For me, um, as long as he's in good graces with um, um, Canelo and his team and Reynoso, uh, uh, he's going to be there. And besides, um, if, 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 if Golden Boy decides to pull the strings on uh, Garcia too soon, uh, that may set Canelo off specifically. And we already know that Canelo Alvarez and Golden Boy, and excuse me, Oscar De La Hoya, uh, um, they're on shaky ground to begin with. Uh, uh, let's just put it out there. Canelo doesn't trust Golden Boy. I don't even think he really likes him. He just tolerates him because it's just business. And yeah, for the time. So given that backdrop, um, Garcia, for the time being, he can get away with talking the way he's talking. He can get away with uh, uh, acting out on Twitter, calling whoever out, uh, because he knows in the end he has folks who has his back. He ain't that. He's not that stupid. <laughs> he's full of vigor and he doesn't have any filter, but he's not entirely stupid. Uh, 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 he he knows that people has his back, and because of that, it is what it is. It's just that the case that he's going to have to back it up eventually. And um, I could see a scenario where Golden Boy, okay, you want to act this way. We're not going to get rid of you, but uh, we're going to pull your car and see what you're about. And they're going to put him out there in a scenario where he's either, it's either sink or swim. And if he sinks, you never know. You never know. Let's move on to some other fights. Let's move on to uh, preview some fights that's happening this week. Um, three fights on the three cards on the bill. Um, one tomorrow, we're recording this show on June the 15th. There's a show, there's an event happening tomorrow on the 16th in Las Vegas. Another card happening on the 18th, yes, also in Vegas. And there's a, a card happening on the uh, 20th, all associated with um, Aram. Let's focus on the card on the 16th. I'll go to you, Daniel. Uh, this card is being headlined by Joshua Gray Jr., who I believe is ranked number one by one of the sanctioning bodies at Bantamweight. Fighting a guy by the name of Plania. Am I wrong in thinking, yeah, Greer is the number one contender? Um, he's on the verge of a title shot, but am I wrong in thinking that maybe he's in for a tougher fight than people anticipate in fighting uh, the, the Filipino Plania? Yeah, you're not wrong. You're not wrong, but the, it's, it's part of the nature of what we're dealing with. Right? Like the main theme of, of, of this podcast has been we're in a situation that we're still in a situation that doing whatever type of training you can is gonna is gonna leave you rusty. You're not gonna look as good as you would would do, and with Greer, who really does need a good showcase fight. It may hurt him a bit, but, but it may hurt him a bit. It's a situation where I you have to grade these fighters right now on curve in a way where all the circumstances that you go into it, may, they may not look good, as good as you think they should have, or, or you may not have looked as sharp as they should have. But as long as he's like 80% there, this should be a pretty decent showcase for Greer. But I do it. Uh, I'll go to you, Gail. Am I wrong in thinking um, Greer, he, he should win, but I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be totally shocked if he was to lose this bout. No, I wouldn't be shocked either. You know, he's had some narrow escapes in his career. Um, he's, you know, won some narrow decisions that, you know, should never have been, you know, quite quite that narrow. Um, 
Yeah, he, he's escaped several times. He does have a loss on his record. Back in 2015, it was to Stephen Fulton, which is interesting, um, in a four-rounder. But um, he's got a kid from the Philippines who's been very ambitious, who's fought all over the place, um, who has a single loss on his record, which was to Juan Carlos Payano. No, no shame in that. And he went the distance with him um, and knocked him down en route to barely losing that fight. So, you know, we could have an interesting little surprise there. This was not the easiest matchup. Plani Mike Plania, who's the opponent, isn't particularly powerful. You know, he does he's not one of those one hitter quitter guys. He if he gets a knockout, it tends to be by accumulated damage or he, he has caught some people unaware from time to time. I mean, he can score a knockout, um, but his knockout percentage is only 50%. That, that's, I think, the reason for the matchup is, yeah, Greer should be able to avoid anything too dangerous, but should. You know, we don't know. This could be the first real upset win by somebody, you know, as we've gotten boxing, you know, with boxing is, you know, crawling before it walks and walks before it runs. Um, this is a fight that everybody better keep an eye on. You know, um, Greer's nickname is Don't Blink, right? And he's he's the guy most people know because his shtick is that he carries a pillow into the ring ripped with with ninety night written on it or night night written on it. Right? I mean that's 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 and, that's and that's, that's, that's all that's yeah that's cute. Yeah, that's, yeah, cute, that's he's, not, he's not he's not he's not the puncher that he tried to make himself out to be. No, he's <laughs> not. He's absolutely not. Um this could be a much more even matchup than anybody accounted for. And and like Daniel said, you know, the training is such an unknown factor. How have guys handled this whole situation while their normal routine has been much, you know, very much disrupted. You know, boxers are and athletes in general are people of routine. They really count on the routine, the way training goes. They want to think about as little as possible about, you know, the whole logistics of it so that they can just focus on craft. And they haven't really been able to do that. So We'll see what happens. Could be could be an interesting outcome. Um, on the undercard of, of, of Greer and Plania, and I'll go to you Gail specifically on this one. Um, uh, undefeated fighter Giovanni um, Satilian um, from your neck of the woods in California. He's fighting a former lightweight champion, Antonio DeMarco. DeMarco's immediately uh, much past his prime. Uh, I want to focus on Santillan because he's basically from your backyard. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, um, insight, any de any specific details about um, who he is and, and the caliber of fighter that uh, he is? Yeah, Santillan's an interesting story. You know, he is from San Diego. He got off to a real good start in his career, and then he stalled due to contractual problems. You know, those damned fights outside the ring that keep guys on the rise out. So he was out of the ring just shy of two years. What a disaster for him. But he's finally back. Hopefully he's finally got it all straightened out. He's being represented by Thompson Boxing. He has a brand new manager. I really, really like it. Um, you know, he's working with Dave McWater. Um, he seems to be settled. So they hope to take him places. But what a minute, you know, as he's he's really hitting the restart button. This was about a lot more than just a virus for him. He, he got in one fight before they got shut down. So he's essentially starting from scratch and he's 28 years old, but he's a pretty fresh 28. Um, his father is his tr head trainer. Um, he does have to work for a living, but he works as a fitness trainer in his dad's gym here in San Diego. So this is a good test for him. Uh, to, to face the DeMarco, uh, who's a Southpaw, who, funny enough, also now lives in the general San Diego area. 
So uh, it's a battle of uh, the South County and the East County in San Diego, which will be fun for some of us locals here to, uh, to watch. And he knows that a really good performance tomorrow night um, could make a huge change in his fortunes. Uh, he, you know, he's got a chance to, you know, blow out a former world champion on national TV. He gets it. He knows there's nothing else going on. And this is his shot. I like the mindset. I like his new situation. You know, that generally gives these guys a whole lot of energy. And he might be the fight of the night. We'll see. Um, th those two fights are happening on the 16th in Vegas, as I said, on the 18th. Um, I'll go to you, Daniel. You have a pretty intriguing matchup, as far as I'm concerned. In fairly interesting as um, Jose Pedraza, who's a former champion at lightweight, gave went rounds with Vasily Lomachenko a couple years ago with 11th rounds, I believe, fighting a uh, Mikhail Lespierre. I believe this is the same Lespierre who went who recently fought Maurice Hooker. Um, fight is happening at 140 pounds, so Pedraza's move. He's up in weight now. Um, level of interest in this fight, uh, how competitive do you think this fight will be? It should be pretty decently competitive, and I'm actually fairly interested in this fight because of Pedraza. Like, he has proven himself to be a decent, pretty good champion when he had the, the IBF title. Now, and... Let's not forget in the fight, there were a couple of instances where he did it, he did show weaknesses in Lomachenko's resume, but obviously he was not really good at those them. But the main thing that has surprised the factors going into a new weight class after you've been at 130 for a bit of 135, it's a different playing field when you go into when you go into the junior welters and no well to weights. It's just a different, different field. So I do expect a tough fight from him. He is good enough where he could he could probably make it as a decision and win. But I think this is probably for more where if he does pretty good, he'll probably stay at 140. If he doesn't, I can see him going back down to 135. I'm going to um, add both of you and Gail into this final fight because we're a little bit running long on the, during the show. Um, on the 20th in Mexico City, uh, the fights on the 16th and the 18th with Joshua Graham, Plania, uh, Santillian, DeMarco, as well as Pedraza and Lespierre. Those fights are going to be airing on ESPN. The fight we're getting ready to talk about now is going to air on ESPN+. Plus. And, and, and thank goodness, because this does not need to be on ESPN, as um, Emmanuel Navarrete is fighting a guy by the name of Lopez in Mexico. Navarrete, uh, WBO champion at 122 pounds. And... Um, I think I can speak for everyone here that this is basically a tune-up, uh, just a showcase foul. fight for uh, uh, the young, strong um, Navarrete um, in his home country of Mexico. Agreed? Oh, yeah. And you know what? Uh, you know, Navarrete, of all guys, has earned it. That man is a beast. He, he wants to fight five times a year. He doesn't give a shit that we've been shut down for three months. He still intends to make it happen. You know, he, he is so, his attitude is so refreshing in today's marketplace. Doesn't care who it is. Doesn't care where it is. He wants his fights. Good for him. There's a studio arrangement. Um, they're calling it Gymnasio TV Azteca in Mexico City. So they'll be in a studio setting, um, uh, set up, you know, for this purpose. And, um, you know, he just wanted to get himself in front of the fans, get himself in there. That That is the role model you, you'd like to see so many more fighters emulate. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a shame that we're so impressed with this. It's a shame that he's such a rare bird, but... Be that as it may, let's just enjoy them while we can. Um, same thoughts of you from you, Daniel. This is basically a, a showcase and a way to uh, 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 get uh, Navarrete some work in. Yeah, but like him, he has more than earned it. He has been the consummate fighter, constantly. 
fighting, constantly defending his time and good doing it. So if there's anybody that has earned a showcase fight in this scenario, it would be him. So yeah, don't expect really much. But it's also remember have to remember this is also the tipping point. Can he stay at one twenty two? Yeah. Yeah. Because or go uh, back uh, to the fights that you think would be logical to make. Uh, yeah. Because uh in my opinion, um never read yeah, he Roman, didn't look great. the whole situation. Ray right, Vargas is off the table now. Yeah, because Roman in his last fight uh, 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 at the end of the year in December, I think it was, uh, uh, he didn't look great. He won. But I thought the, the fact that he is a grown young man uh, will probably fight at 26 sooner than, rather than later. Um, I thought he struggled a bit. Uh, the energy just wasn't there. So I think this, uh, yeah, stay busy fight. Uh, to keep him active and, and to and to keep his weight down for probably one, maybe two more title defenses at 122 pounds before he he eventually moves up. And um, I think we're going to uh, shut the show down, uh, this particular episode down on, on, on that note. Um, I want to once again thank everybody who joined us in the live YouTube chat, uh, uh, the homie Amma, uh, Saint Brit Sports, B Space. If you like what you heard. Uh, tonight, please make sure to hit that like button. Please make sure to dis- hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Also, make sure to subscribe to us on all platforms at Carry Podcast, particularly iTunes, uh, uh, Spotify, as well as Google Podcast and Google Play Music. Um, I'll go around to the panel here as we always start with Ladies First when she's here, and we always end with Ladies First when she's here. Gail for Community Digital News. Uh, for those who want to talk to Sweet Science, for those who want to talk to media, uh, where you get where you uh, teach that on the, well, not the side job because you get paid to do that. So anytime you get paid, it's not a side gig, but still uh, for those who want to talk <laughs> boxing, for those who want to talk media, let the folks know where they can hit you up. Well, you can find my regular column, which will appear uh, in the next hour or two previewing this fight. Although you already heard it all. It's at communities, digital news, which is com C O M M digi D I G I news, com digi news com. And you can also catch me this week on another return appearance on TMZ live. I think it'll be. Oh, dope. Dope. I that's, think it'll be Wednesday. Dope. Yeah. Me, me and Harvey, you know, they give me a call and here I am part of the, Part of the uh, viewer peanut gallery. What a what a hoot! And uh, go to you, Daniel, for those who want to talk uh, the sweet science. For those who you want to who want to talk the NBA, uh, it's particularly given this time when there's been so much uh, discussion about whether the NBA will return and the infamous Zoom meeting that took place a few days back, in which Kyrie said some things and uh, uh, LeBron as well. Um, not on a Zoom meeting, but still, uh, the season is in flux right now. I don't know whether the season, whether it, we will have an NBA season if we do win. Um, so for those who want to talk NBA, and particularly as it pertains to uh, Ma- the Miami Heat, let the folks know where they can find you. Right, as folks, you can find me on Twitter at Rockers99. Hopefully, I think it's this is the week where I'm going to lock down the interview with Miss Rosado. Her, her Philly fight card, she's like I said, she's been trying to get that card up and running. And she has fought hard, but then things happen. But definitely catch it out. And like I stated before, uh, this is probably the third, third time. Uh, if you're a basis, your season is probably dead. And unfortunately, given every Everything that's happening, even with Adam Silver on Sports Center, I lean more towards the NBA not returning this year. Indeed, indeed. Um, for those who want to talk to Sweet Science, for those who want to talk music or fitness, you know what it is on Twitter. Uh, Brother JR and Brother JR76. As I said at the beginning of the show, if you want to find out all the information about Pound for Pound Box Report, if you're checking us out live on YouTube, please hit that subscription button. Please hit that description below to where to find us all over social media and where to find the podcast. If not, if you're checking us out uh, via podcasts like iTunes, Spotify, and whatnot, please go to the blog page, p4pboxreport.wordpress.com, where you can find links to where to find this, all things Pound for Pound Box Report on social media, where you can find the podcast on all platforms. 
RSS feeds that carry podcast um, where you can donate to the show. Uh, my online fitness coaching link on the next episode, we will do a recap of the uh, fight between uh, Greer and Plania, uh, the fight between um, Cecilia and DeMarco on the undercard of that Greer fight, uh, Pedraza and Les Pierre, um, the Navarrete fight, which is again, basically a showcase. We will talk about that. We didn't have time to talk about it tonight, but some interesting comments from one Tyson Fury who we talked about earlier in the show. Um, interesting comments he made to Michelle Joy Phelps in response to uh, uh, the dust step that Anthony Joshua got into. We make sure to talk about that next week. Just Gail or Daniel, just send me a reminder of that on Twitter. Um, and we will do a uh, um, preview of some fights that's coming up as well on via Top Rank Boxing. Um, the Maloney brothers from Australia, um, Andrew Maloney, who's ranked number one by the WBA at 115 pounds. Um, he's going to be fighting on the 23rd in Las Vegas. Uh, Christopher Diaz, former junior lightweight, no, former featherweight, excuse me, uh, um, world title challenger. Um, he's going to be fighting on the undercard of Maloney and who's fighting, um, a guy by the name of Franco. Andrew Maloney on the 23rd. His brother, Jason Maloney, who's a very, very good bantamweight. Um, he's fighting on the 25th, also in Vegas. Also, Miguel Burchelt, junior lightweight champion. He's fighting on the 27th in Mexico on the undercard of that. Um, Elwin Soto, who has a world title at 108 pounds. Um, he's going to be fighting in a nine title fight on the undercard. So we'll be talking about all those fights. Um, a little bit of teaser in terms of what Tyson Fury said, late breaking news um, during the recording of the show. So we will talk about all of that. So this has been episode 289 of the Pound for Pound Box Report. One to two once again. Thank everybody who joined us in the live chat. For Gail from Communities Digital News, for Daniel of the Inscriber, I'm your host, Michael. We will see you next time. Everyone have a good evening. Good night.